So tonight we continue our We of Christmas series. Um, I, I don't know about you, uh, so I won't speak for you, but I know I have enjoyed it greatly. Uh, David, beginning two weeks ago and talking about Zacharias and Elizabeth, and then Melissa last night sharing the heart of Mary and the, the reality of Mary's life. And then tonight we take one more step into another character of the Advent story, and Jonathan is going to be coming to talk to us about the life of Joseph. Um, for whatever reason, Joseph gets left out a lot, right? Like we, uh, maybe it's because he wasn't really written about a after a few chapters. Um, he gets left out a lot. I think we forget how much there is to learn um, and how much God did in him, but also how much God did through him. So, Jonathan, thank you for, uh, for being willing. Thank you for uh, how seriously I know you take God's word and just uh, let God have his way. Thank you, brother. Thank you. Uh, can you guys hear me okay? Yes. Uh, thank you again for the opportunity to be up here. And, um, I first want to start again by uh, get, uh, thanking you guys once again for uh, your heart towards me and my family. Um, you guys have been uh, so encouraging to us and uh, so giving to us and uh, I just want to Again, personally, thank you guys, Senior Refuge, for being, for, for showing us and for being we to us. Amen. Um, it, uh, what you guys, your, your prayers, your encouragements, everything is, has been priceless. And I can't thank you guys, you know, Amber and I can't thank you guys enough. And so can Mike, because he can't talk yet. But <laughs> when he can, he'll, he'll, he'll thank you. Um, so I want to. We're going to be reading the key uh, section is going to be from Matthew chapter 1 verses uh, 18 and 25. And I'm reading for the, from the ESV. And it begins, uh, Now the birth of Jesus Christ took place in this way. When his mother Mary had, be, had been betrothed to Joseph, before they came together, she was found to be with child from the Holy Spirit. And her husband Joseph, being a just man and unwilling to put her to shame, resolved to divorce her quietly. But as he considered these things, behold, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream, saying, Joseph, son of David, do not fear to take Mary as your wife, for that which is conceived in her is from the Holy Spirit. She will bear a son, and you shall call his name Jesus, for he will save his people from their sins. All this took place to fulfill what the Lord had spoken by the prophet. Behold, the virgin shall conceive and bear a son, and they shall call his name Emmanuel, which means God with us. When Joseph woke from his sleep, he did as the angel of the Lord commanded him. He took his wife but knew her not until she had given birth to a son, and he called his name Jesus. Most of us are familiar with this passage when we're talking about the Christmas narrative. But the focus is usually concerning Mary or Miriam, and that's fine. But as Amy said earlier, Joseph usually gets left out. Sometimes the way we tell the story uh, Joseph is treated as someone who just happened to be at the right place, at the right time, be to the to the right girl, right young woman. If you're like me, you spent very little time pausing and digesting just how much Joseph contributed and co-labored with Mary and also with God. You know, concerning Joseph, let's, let's remember that God does nothing randomly. Mm -hmm. Okay? Yeah. We could go back to Genesis. He chose one specific family, the family of Noah, to repopulate the earth. He chose one specific man and one specific barren woman, Abraham and Sarah, by which he would make the parents of the nation of Israel. He chose that specific nation to be a light unto the Gentiles. Out of that nation, he chose a specific tribe, a specific tribe of Judah by which the Messiah would come out of. 
the one who would crush the head of the serpent would come out of a specific tribe of Israel. Out of that tribe, in a specific place, and at the right time, God chose a specific couple, not just woman, couple. A specific woman to birth that Messiah, and a specific man to help raise and guide that Messiah as he grew. That is Joseph. If we know, and we do know, that God chose Mary specifically to give birth to the Messiah, do we stop to think about how Joseph was chosen to raise the Messiah? Our God is a God of specificity. None, nothing is done by him on a whim. Nothing is done by accident. Joseph being the earthly father of Jesus is by no means an exception to that. So one of the things that stands out to me, what that stood out to me in my, uh, in my, in my study, is not only that, not only was Joseph described as a just man, or in some translations, a righteous man, but that's the same way that some of our other biblical heroes was described. Mm -hmm. Noah, Job, Simeon, John the Baptizer, all of them were described the same way. A just man, or a righteous man. I don't think that's a coincidence. How often do we overlook that? In addition to speaking about Joseph, I also want to speak on the meaning of Christmas because Joseph's life shows us how to react to Christmas, to the meaning of Christmas, the true meaning of Christmas. In the section of scripture that we just read, I believe that's where you find the real meaning of Christmas that we miss too often. So I'll read, I'll read a smaller section of it. But as he considered these things, behold, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream, saying, Joseph, son of David, do not fear to take Mary as your wife, for that which is conceived in her is from the Holy Spirit. She will bear a son, and you shall call his name Jesus, for he will save his people from their sins. Notice the reason for the name is that he will save his people from his sins. Let me ask you a question. How often do we think of this when speaking of the birth of the Messiah during Advent or Christmas season? Is this part of your personal Christmas narrative? When speaking to your kids or to your loved ones or to strangers you meet out in the streets, about Christmas and the meaning of Christmas, do we bring up and do we emphasize that the reason the Son of God wrapped himself in human flesh, the reason that he became, he was born of a virgin, the reason that he came as the prophet said he would hundreds of years prior was to save people from their sins. How often do we think of that? How often is that forgotten? Because that's the Christmas story. That's the, that's the meaning of Christmas. The Christmas story screams that we need deliverance. It's quite explicit. The Christmas story really begins in the Garden of Eden. Genesis 3, the fall. The colossal failure that separated us from God. How often do we speak on our condition apart from God when we're talking about this season? Do we talk about it at all? As a culture, do we talk about it at all? But even more importantly, as the church, as God's body, do we talk about it? Or have we been lulled away into accepting the more sanitized narrative of Christmas. 
you know, just mixing in some of scripture here and there about a random baby named Jesus that we just happen to celebrate on the 25th of December. The reason for the season, the true meaning of Christmas, is in his name. Literally. The literal name, the literal meaning of the name Jesus Yeshua, the name literally means the Lord is salvation. Or the Lord is Savior. What does that imply? It implies we need saving. It implies we need deliverance. We need saving from our sins. Is it just me or does that fact kind of get lost over? Especially when it comes to the Christmas season. We get caught in the hype of it. The shopping. The lights. The trees. The Christmas spirit. What is the Christmas spirit? I don't feel the Christmas spirit anymore. Maybe because we, we forgot the true meaning of Christmas. Maybe the Christmas spirit we knew wasn't even <laughs> the, the true meaning of Christmas. In 1 John chapter 4, verses 9-11, through 11, uh, the Apostle John writes, In this, the love of God was made manifest among us, that God sent his only Son into the world so that we might live through him. In this is love, not that we have loved God, but that he loved us and sent his Son to be the propitiation for our sins. Beloved, if God so loved us, we also ought to love one another. This is another Christmas verse. But we wouldn't, you know, we don't recognize it as a Christmas verse because where's, where's the angels and the stars and Mary? The baby, where's sweet baby Jesus? No, this is a Christmas story. The entire scripture is the reason for the season. And keep this in mind when it comes to Joseph. Because when God sent his only son into the world so that he, we might live through him, he sent him into Joseph's house under Joseph's care. Think about the weight of that responsibility. Within Joseph's and Mary's care was the one that was promised to come ever since the fall in the Garden of Eden. The promised seed that God told Abraham that would bless the nations. The prophet that Moses said in Deuteronomy 18 that God would send the divinic king whose throne would be everlasting. And it was their charge to raise that child up. Do we think about that? Do we realize the gravity of that charge? Because here's the thing. Joseph and Mary did. It's not like they didn't know that the birth of Jesus would change everything. They knew. It didn't. <laughs> so the next time you hear the song, Mary did you know. <laughs> <laughs> the answer is yes. They knew. Okay? Both Mary and Joseph knew. The angel told them so. <laughs> right? Remember, the angel told Mary that the son she would conceive would be called the son of the Most High and that he would reign on the throne of David forever and that his kingdom would never end. Mary heard the prophecies of Elizabeth and Zacharias concerning John the Baptizer. Being the forerunner of the Messiah, Joseph was told that Jesus would save his people from his sins. They were told that Jesus Yeshua would be great in the eyes of the Lord and that he would be great to the nation of Israel. And keep this in mind, this is after 400 years of silence from God. They're being told this after 400 years of silence. God suddenly 
breaks the national silence. First to Zacharias and to Elizabeth, then to Miriam and Joseph. But not only does he break the silence, he breaks the silence with news that the anointed one, the promised one from the days of the forefathers is here. And it's that baby in your care. That's, that's when we know Israel knew that a Messiah was coming all throughout their history. So they knew. And there's no reason to doubt that they talked to each other. They were a regular, a regular couple. They talked to each other about the prophecies that they heard. They talked to each other about the prophecies concerning their son while they were raising. There's no doubt that they talked about it over and over and over again and asked each other, what do you think? Right? What do you think? How can this be? They're probably amazed constantly. I mean, think of it. If an angel appears to you concerning anything, I don't think that's something you're going to forget. Right? The angel appeared to both of them individually at separate times. Not only that, the angel appeared to Mary's cousin, barren cousin, and what do you know, the woman that was once called barren now has a son. These are things you don't ever forget. These are things you don't ever talk about. In fact, I believe those were signs undeniable signs that they looked back to whenever they got discouraged Amen. or began to doubt. Amen. And by the way, I believe God has signs in all of our lives yes. that we can look back to whenever we begin to doubt. You know what would be another thing that you would not forget? A group of random shepherds <laughs> coming to you just after your wife gave birth, mm -hmm. telling you both how angels appeared to them and told them that in Bethlehem, the city of David, a savior would be born who is Messiah, the Lord. And that's how they knew how to find you. Because they were told by a host of angels that the boy in the manger, uh -huh. your son, is the Messiah. I, I want to keep those titles in mind. Right? A Savior who is born, Messiah the Lord. The, those titles and, and the previous titles that I said, those aren't just fancy titles. Those are messianic titles of deity. Again, next time you hear that song, they knew. All right? Mary did, you know? Yeah, I knew. All right? That's how, they, that's how the shepherds used to find them, where to find them. And again, Joseph and Mary were, were told at the temple when they went to, to, uh, to give uh, the sacrifice for Mary's firstborn, they were told by Simeon that the baby that they had was the consolation, the comforting of Israel, that he was the Lord's Messiah, a light to the Gentiles, appointed to the fall and rise of many in Israel. And then they were told by Anna that this is the redemption of Jerusalem. They, they were told over and over and over and over and over again. And you know what's amazing out of all of this? Joseph and Mary were told what was happening concerning the Messiah. Get this. In ways that are much clearer than what the prophets knew. Think about that. They knew, they had a much clearer picture than what the prophets had. And they were raising the Messiah. And let's not forget the wise men. The wise men, the, the, the Magi, or Magi, came searching for the one who had been born king of the Jews. Again, that's not just a fancy title. King of the Jews. They visited Joseph and Mary at their house. At the house. Not in the manger. Like most of our scenes are. You know, you know what I'm saying? 
Jesus was a toddler by them. And there's no doubt that they told Joseph and Mary why they were there. Why? To pay tribute to their son, the king of the Jews. And Herod. Herod himself tried to kill Jesus. But Joseph, being warned in a dream, took his family and fled to Egypt. There goes the responsibility of the earthly father of Jesus again. To protect the growing Messiah. Let's not overlook that. That, that was Joseph's charge. And Herod, because the wise men never returned to him to pinpoint which child the king of the Jews would be, had all the kids in the town, two years and younger, killed. Quick note on Herod. Uh, David mentioned it a little bit in his, in his sermon two weeks ago. But Herod was a man obsessed with maintaining his power. So much so that according to historical records, he had his, most, his more popular brother-in-law killed. He also killed his favorite wife and killed three of his own sons, one of them just five days before he died. He was a man of great cruelty to those who he perceived as threats to his authority and to his position. So his reaction to seeing that the wise men weren't coming to him to pinpoint who the king of the Jews would be, Shouldn't surprise us. And let's slow down and get this. In all likelihood, those children that Herod had killed were children of families that Joseph and Mary knew. Most likely, those were the children of some of the women who Mary did laundry with. Think about that. In all likelihood, those toddlers, it's very possible that those toddlers that were killed, some of them were probably playmates of Yeshua the toddler. Those towns were small, and we know the Jewish people are very familiar with each other. Think of the weight of that. Again, Joseph was warned, he took his family and he fled. And the people that they knew their kids got slaughtered. Think of the weight of that. It puts a damper on the common Christmas mood that we're used to, right? Can you imagine the pain amongst the joy and amazement in their hearts? Yeah, they had very great and mighty revelations from God concerning Jesus. But they also had to deal with the threat of great evil by one of the most powerful men in the region. And again, that was Joseph's charge. Also, don't miss, don't, don't miss the comparison here, right? Herod killed children, even his own children, in order to keep a hold of the power and authority he had while God sent his son to die for us to make us adopted children of his. Herod killed children in order to keep hold of the power that he had while the son of God laid his power and authority down to make his enemies his brethren. That's, that's amazing. What you have here is the proudness of Herod and the humility of God. One destroys and the other gives life. That's the humility of God. The incarnation, the Christmas story displays how humble God is. Humble to the point of entrusting a human family to be protectors and providers of the promised one, his son. God did 
didn't have to do that. But he entrusted his son into the care of his creation. Let me talk about humility. Now Joseph, by taking Mary as his wife, this gets skipped over too often, I believe. He stepped into the shame that Mary was married. Right? They, they bore one another's burdens. Amen. The societal shame that came from family and friends and strangers who had made assumptions based on their own limited understanding. Don't, don't miss this. Joseph, Jesus' earthly father, laid down his life laid down his reputation to be a co-laborer with God the Father. Amen. Don't miss that. There was a cost to his obedience, yeah. and he did it willingly. Amen. And so they married, and they walked in it together. On the Sermon of the Mount, in Matthew 5, Jesus said, Blessed are you when people insult you, and persecute you and falsely say all kinds of evil against you because of me. The first people that were spoken falsely of and insulted because of Jesus was his earthly father and his earthly mother. That's Joseph and Mary. We kind of do a disservice to Joseph by... Uh, skipping over him like that. That's why they experience, that's what they experienced for the rest of their lives. We don't know to what degree, but we do know that the rumors persisted and the insult persisted. Even after Joseph's death. Yet they knew that they were exactly where God wanted them to be doing exactly what God wanted them to do. They knew that they were favored by God, and so they kept doing what they were already doing, being obedient. To this world, they were being foolish. To this world, Joseph got played. To this world, Mary got one over on him. To God, they were righteous people joining him in his work. As David said two weeks ago, there were righteous people joining God in the work of redeeming the world. When, when scripture says in Luke chapter 2 verses uh, 52 that Jesus kept increasing in wisdom and stature and in favor of God and men, Joseph was a co-worker in that with God. It's very easy to miss, but in Joseph, but Joseph's life, as described by Scripture, has very simple but vital recurring themes. And I would encourage you to, to read the first few chapters of Mark, I mean of, of Matthew and Luke, and read it slowly and you'll see. These themes are obedience, revelation, marvel, obedience. Those moments that Joseph shared with Mary concerning Jesus, that's what they were full of. Obedience, revelation, marvel, obedience. I think that's the response we should have to Christmas. That's the blueprint. That's the response. That's the proper response to the Christmas story. We marvel at the revelation that God came for us, that he sent his son for us. The incarnation, we marvel at that. And then we obey. Right? Now, not much is, not much is written of Joseph, as Amy said earlier, because he's never mentioned again after the account of when Jesus was 12 years old in the temple. So scholars believe he died before the ministry of Jesus began. 
but just, just follow me on this, all right? This, this might be a bit of a stretch, but I don't think so. You know, there's another person who had a very similar description as Joseph did. And that's Joseph of the Sanhedrin. He was another Joseph who was said to be a just man. That's the man who gave his tool to be used to bury the body of Jesus. I don't believe it's a coincidence that the man who gave up his grave for Jesus' body to lay in had the same name as the man who gave up his life and reputation and his home to the growing body of Jesus. I don't, I don't think that's a coincidence. Again, God does nothing randomly. The meaning of the name of Joseph is he will increase. In Genesis, Joseph, the favorite son of Jacob, because of his steadfast obedience to God, was used by God to be the means by which the nation of Israel would end up in Egypt and would increase abundantly, multiply, and grow. Thousands of years later, the earthly father of Jesus, in his obedience to God, joined God in playing a vital role in raising Jesus, ultimately to multiply not just the nation, but even more so, more sons and daughters of God. Both Jews and Gentiles. We. Amen. That's we in its fullness. Yes. So ultimately, we learn the meaning of Christmas from the name of Jesus Yeshua. But, but I believe we, we, we learn the proper response from Joseph's life. That is obedience, marvel at the revelation, more obedience. Are you praying with me? Lord, thank you for sending your son. Thank you for your character. Thank you for reaching down for us. Thank you for reaching down to reconcile us to yourself. And you do, did it in such a, a marvelous way. Lord, I pray that we would take this lesson, the lesson of Joseph, of obedience. I pray that we would marvel at the revelation of Christ coming in the form of a, in, in the form of a human, taking on flesh, living for us, dying for us. I pray that we would marvel that the godly came for the ungodly. And that you would spark life in our conscience, in our heart that we would react properly, mm -hmm. that we would obey, that we would live out of the joy that you give. Help us to be sensitive to that. Help us to realize that it is only in you that true joy can be found. That's what the Christmas story is about. I thank you for the example of your earthly father and earthly mother because they knew. And that's what they show us. So Lord, thank you. Thank you for what you have done. Thank you for what you are doing. For those of us that need reminding, remind them, remind them, remind us. For those of us that need strengthening, strengthen us. Thank you, Lord, for your mercy, for your humility, for your grace. And thank you for these things in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 You know, um, I just, uh, 
Thank you, Jonathan. Thank, thank you so much. Uh, thank you for God's word. Thank you for handling it carefully. Um, the thing that I have absolutely didn't expect but have loved week after week is that every single step of the advent of the Christmas story has been a light shining on obedient people calling us to be obedient people. Right? Ze Zechariah was just doing what he was called to do. A man who could have been living in disappointment instead was living in obedience. A man and a woman who did not have what their hearts desired, but they kept their hearts focused on Jesus, on, 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 the, on God the Father. And then you have Mary, a woman preparing for a life that she had dreamed about, and an angel interrupted that life, and instead of arguing and figuring out how to make what she wanted fit what God was saying, she yielded what she had always expected and grabbed hold of what he said. And she did it with obedience. And then you have a man whose life was literally going to be turned upside down. Because first, of the actions, apparently, of his fiance. And then now, because of the word of the Lord. And in all of this, these four people all made a decision. I will not live from or for what I had expected. I will live in what God is saying. And they just stayed obedient. How often do our steps get changed in our obedience shape? How often does our situation seem to waver and our faithfulness is the first thing to shrink? How often does a new season mean we need a new word rather than staying obedient to what God has already spoken? I'm praying that this Advent season, and this was the reason we wanted to slow this whole thing down and do this differently. I'm praying that we'll redeem this season by letting all of the stuff we get caught up in go. So that we can just hold on to the one thing we've been called to. And that is obedience to the word of God. Would you stand with me please? And we'll finish tomorrow. Father, I thank you tonight. That your heart's desire for every single person you've ever created is that they would become your children and join you in your purpose. And I thank you that those are the examples we've been given in the Christmas story. People, simple people, some of them living difficult lives, some of them living the lives they had planned on, and some of them having their plans blown up. And yet these people all have the same thing in common they stayed faithful to you because they trusted your faithfulness to them. And so tonight, God, I pray that we would be a people who are marked by Advent, not just with the marveling, just, not, not just with the revelation, but with obedience to what your word has called us to. May you forgive us tonight, Lord, we repent tonight of all of the things we have set down, all of the things we have walked away from, all of the things we've become an inconsistent in, all of the things we've chased after at the peril of your word. And may we be a people who choose you, and choose you, and choose you. Simply for one reason. You have chosen us. And so God, I pray tonight that you would shine a light on our disobedient places, and that tonight we would yield to you. That tonight we would not fight any longer, we would not push against the pricks, we would not explain, we would not wait and see. That tonight we would decide, I will trust you through obedience. So that we too could steward the Spirit of God as the people of God, joining the plan of God that many would come to salvation. Thank you for saving us. Thank you that you came to save us. May we join you in the work of salvation. Lord, as we go, may we go in your name. May we go in your spirit. May we go in your character. And may we go for your glory. Because we are convinced of this. Where Jesus is glorified, people are redeemed. And so tonight I just... Pray over you, the Lord bless you and keep you. 
The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift his countenance upon you and give you peace. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. God bless you guys. Thank you so much. Jonathan, thank you again. Yeah.